everybody tonight um, to the Coastal Studies Institute Science on the Sound series. Um, my name is Rachel Gitman. I'm a new uh, assistant professor at East Carolina University. Um, I was told to give a little background on myself. Um, so I'm actually not new to North Carolina. Um, I did my PhD at UNC Chapel Hills Institute of Marine Sciences. Um, started in 2009, graduated in 2014. Did a, did a brief stint uh, in terms of a postdoc in Boston uh, at Northeastern University. Realized it was way too cold and too many people. <laughs> and said, ah, I got to go back to North Carolina. Um, I'm a native of Virginia originally, uh, the Richmond area. Spent every summer that I can remember coming down to the, to the Outer Banks, um, Hatteras, Avon, Nags Head, you name it. I, I spent some time there and loved it. And it's probably the reason I became a marine ecologist. So, my training is in marine ecology. Um, I've really focused in on, on a lot of the applied issues um, related to restoration and conservation. Um, and I hope to continue that as a faculty member at ECU. I'm in the Department of Biology, but I'm jointly appointed with the Institute for Coastal Science and Policy. Um, what you will see in this talk is not just ecology. Um, it's going to be a little bit of engineering. It's going to be a little of geology, and it's going to be a little social science. It's actually going to include data I collected from North Carolina residents that I surveyed as a graduate student, um, their perspectives on, on coastal ecosystems and what we can do to, to protect our coastlines and also enjoy them. So um, I hope you enjoy the talk, and we'll have time for questions afterwards. So coastal ecosystems should be very familiar to everybody here in the room. You can just look right out there and you see a coastal ecosystem. Um, they're near and dear to my heart, um, not just from a, a research perspective, but just because they're where I really like to be. So oyster reefs, salt marshes, and seagrass beds um, really make up uh, a vital component of our coastline. They provide a variety of um, services and benefits to us um, and to uh, the organisms that depend upon them. So, uh, some of the benefits that we get from our salt marshes, our oyster reefs, and our seagrass beds are they provide habitat for a lot of things we like to eat, um, especially when they're juveniles. Um, so a lot of our recreationally valuable fish use marshes and seagrass beds and oyster reefs before they grow big and fat and are ready for us to catch them. Um, oyster reefs also and marshes as well provide sediment stabilization, which will be a larger topic um, as I kind of continue with this talk. Um, they trap the sediment. They allow it to creep behind um, for the, in the case of oyster reefs and then within the marsh. Um, so they, kind of, they can actually prevent erosion over time. Um, they can attenuate wave energy. So um, an intertidal oyster reef that's uh, seaward of a salt marsh is actually attenuating some of those waves that are coming through and reducing the energy and the impact on that shoreline. Um, and then actually they can store carbon. So in the context of concerns about climate change, marshes, uh, seagrass beds, and now even more recently our group has shown that oyster reefs in certain contexts can be carbon sinks. So they can actually store CO2 over time scales that matter relative to climate change. So there's lots of reasons to protect these systems aside from the fact that we just enjoy them. And protection of these systems is really vital given all of the losses we're experiencing. So we love the coast. People want to live along the water, but, but a, a consequence of that is that we're losing a lot of our coastal habitats. And so these are just some numbers um, from some global studies that have tried to quantify how much we've lost in terms of our salt marshes, our sea grasses, our oyster reefs. You could do the same thing for mangroves, for kelp forests. It's a, bleak, um, it's a bleak outlook if you think about what we've actually lost um, in terms of these habitats and the associated services. And a lot of this loss, not all, but a lot, is tied to us wanting to live along the coast. We, when we move to the coast, we do lots of different things. We develop the coastline, um, we, we extract from the water, um, we move things around. This is an extreme example of coastal development I like to put up. This is Dubai. So they like the coast so much that they've built new coasts. They've actually created entire islands just so people can have waterfront property. I mean, that's how much people really love the water and love being on the water. Um, but this, is, this looks pretty in some ways, but it can have some really negative consequences for the marine organisms that depend on these nearshore systems. So when you move all of that sediment around, you can end up with a lot of 
sedimentation that might bury in, bury, in this case, coral reefs. Um, it can cause um, a lot of turbidity in the, in the um, water column that can kill off uh, submerged aquatic vegetation. It can cause um, low oxygen levels because of all that turbidity. Um, you can have algal blooms because water gets constricted. So there's just a lot of effects of moving sediment and changing the coastline that we sometimes don't think about when we're trying to develop uh, the coast. And Dubai is an extreme example, but we developed the coastline right here. So this is a, an aerial view of Kerala. Um, you see some natural habitats, but you see lots of houses as well. And we want to live on the coast. We want people to continue to live on the coast. And so I would argue with this talk, this is not a talk about not wanting to live on the coast, but how can we maybe live on the coast and also sustain the coastal ecosystems that drove us to come here to begin with? And one aspect of, of coastal development, I think, that we can um, kind of tr transition to a different approach is how we harden the shoreline. Um, so when you have a waterfront property and you have, say, some erosion you've noticed along your shoreline, you may want to stop that erosion because you want to hold on to your waterfront property. That's valuable property, right? And the more erosion you get, the closer your house is to that shoreline, and that, that can have consequences that we've seen a lot on the Outer Banks. So especially along our oceanfront coastlines. Um, now, fortunately in North Carolina, um, our oceanfront coastlines are relatively untouched from, from hardening. We don't have seawalls, we don't have um, a lot of rocks. We have a couple terminal, dro terminal groins um, at our inlets in particular, but, but mostly we have pretty un um, undeveloped uh, oceanfront. That's not necessarily the case for our estuarine shorelines. So we do tend to put up um, artificial structures to prevent erosion, and also just to provide access for docks, um, greater access just in terms of getting to the water um, when you have a waterfront property. And so this is something I really uh, got interested in as a graduate student, and even before I was a graduate student working for the Navy. Um, they were experimenting with different ways of stabilizing the shoreline that incorporated both living and um, engineered structures. And so, I really came to grad school wanting to know, like, what are the different ecological impacts of these different approaches? And when I talk about these approaches, I'm talking about seawalls or bulkheads. Bulkheads are the smaller version of a seawall, and that's what we typically see on our estuarine coasts here. Um, riprap is basically any kind of rubble, rock, granite material that's piled right up on shore. Um, sometimes it's marl, sometimes it's cement, but it's generally called riprap. And then breakwaters or offshore breakwaters or sills is kind of the third category that I really explore. And this is sometimes coupled with a living component. So you might have a salt marsh coupled with an offshore breakwater. And so these three categories of, of engineering or hardening will be what I talk about for the remainder of the talk. And so as a first step, um, when I was a first year graduate student, I simply had the question, OK, so I've seen people harden their shorelines. I know that this is potentially an ecological issue that I want to study, but I want to know how common it is. Is this really just confined to our major cities? Are we, are we really talking about a very small percentage of our shoreline, or are we talking about a lot? And I thought I could honestly just Google this, and I could find the answer. Like, we would just know. You know, I'm from the, I'm from the Google generation. Like, you can just Google it, right? Um, but no, of course not. And I started contacting state agencies, federal agencies, and I'm like, how much of our shoreline have we hardened? Because we permit these structures, we, we apparently track them, and I found that we didn't have a really good way to answer that question. Um, and so after about a year of digging and, and talking to people, um, I did come across a data set that was actually being used um, to look at uh, oil spill response by NOAA. So they were classifying shorelines and compiling data so that they could say, um, particularly after Deepwater Horizon, what shorelines are most vulnerable to oiling? And in that process, they compiled data on how much of the shoreline had actually been hardened. It just needed to be kind of reformatted and, and reanalyzed to get this number. And so what this map represents is coastal counties, and the colors, kind of warm, uh, warm colors mean more of the hardened, sh more um, shoreline is hardened, so a higher percentage in that county. Cooler colors, the blues, it's less of a, uh, hardening in that county. And again, when I'm talking about hardening, it's a whole suite of these engineered structures. And so in total, it's really only 14% of the shoreline. But that number, even though it's a low percentage, 
it really translates to about 22,000 kilometers of shoreline in the United States. So it's not a small number. It's a lot of shoreline. And a lot of it actually is in our estuaries. Um, and it's not just in our major cities. Um, it kind of starts around our major urban areas. But as you know, the population grows, we're seeing more and more hardening in less uh, densely populated areas. And with the predictions for how many people are going to want to move to the coast in the future, um, we expect that this hardening is going to continue unless we change our, our policies or change our opinions about how to engineer and how to stabilize our shoreline. So when we look at North Carolina, I hope initially everybody's like, oh, good, blue and green. Like, we're, do we're doing really well in this state. And we are in a lot of ways. So we have relatively low percentage of hardening. One, that's because we have a lot of shoreline we could harden. Two, we don't have... Um, these major urban centers like a lot of other states do. Um, we have, you know, some densely populated areas, but we, we actually are in a position to, um, to prevent maybe some of the adverse ecological effects of hardening if we take the right, uh, right approach. So first, to kind of understand what is the right approach, you know, what is the best thing to do if you need to stabilize your shoreline, um, from an ecological perspective, we just really didn't know. When I came into grad school, we didn't have a good understanding of what this kind of engineering was doing to our nearshore habitats. And so that was kind of the first thing I started to, to try to answer. And so I um, categorized, again, like these different types of hardening based on kind of what my understanding of what the different impacts might be. And so I started um, early in grad school and, and really didn't finish until I was a postdoc because there were so few studies. I had to wait and find out, um, you know, find that there were enough studies to actually do this analysis. But this is essentially a review of all of the studies ever published across the globe on the ecological effects of shoreline hardening. And I'll walk you through this graph in a second. Um, and so I, I just scoured the literature and I recorded responses that people measured in the field to whether or not the shoreline was, was hardened with a bulkhead or a seawall as compared to a natural shoreline. It might have been a rocky intertidal shoreline. It might have been a salt marsh. They were all included in this analysis. But they had to have a comparison between a hardened shoreline and a natural shoreline. And the two metrics I used, um, because they were most commonly measured, are biodiversity and then the abundance of organisms. So people typically, when they go out and survey and do um, do a research study, they're almost always going to collect data on the total number of species that are present, and they're going to collect the numbers of those in organisms that are present. And this is across all different taxa, you know, from your, your fish to your um, barnacles to your bivalves. Um, this is everything included. And so what this graph is showing you is the top graph is the difference between a hardened shoreline and a natural shoreline in terms of biodiversity, and the lower graph is abundance. And this is for seawalls and bulkheads, riprap, and breakwaters. And so the point I want to make with this graph really is that if you are below uh, that line, that means you're having a negative impact, or you have lower biodiversity and lower abundance of organisms along seawalls and bulkheads as compared to their natural counterparts. So less less diversity and fewer organisms. And so from an ecological perspective, that's, that's not a good thing. Um, in terms of the other two, um, you'll see that there's these error bars around. And so what we find is if it crosses that zero mark, it means it's not different between natural and, um, and hardened shorelines. So there's no significant difference. Um, although you do see there's a bit of a trend there. So riprap, slightly negative, and breakwaters are slightly positive. So we do see that there's difference in what we do along the shoreline in terms of the eco ecological impacts. And so I want to explore that further um, as we go. And so in terms of um, the, the types of organisms that, are, that seem to, to be affected by the shore condition, um, it's not limited to one group. Um, so the benthic infauna, you tend to have um, fewer species of benthic infauna, that, that can be your, your burrowing clams. It can be lots of little critters that live in the sediment um, that fish like to eat, um, amphipods, worms. Um, they might not seem very exciting or special, but they're really important food for other uh, larger organisms that we care about. 
Shorebirds were a big one. Um, across this, all of the studies, it was consistent that you had fewer shorebirds when you had a seawall or a bulkhead. And that was primarily because of the amount of intertidal habitat that was often associated with that seawall or bulk, bulkhead. Shorebirds need this broad intertidal flat often, or really shallow at least, areas to forage on all of the little organisms that are in that environment. And it seems that when you have a seawall or a bulkhead, you get this deepening of that area and you lose some of that intertidal habitat. And so that's, that's the mechanism that the authors invoke as to why you see this uh, loss of diversity of shorebirds. And then our nectin, which is really our mobile fish and crustaceans, blue crabs, our um, marsh killifish, mummy togs, pinnated shrimp, spot. Um, you just tend to see fewer of these individuals and an overall lower diversity when you have a seawall as compared to, say, a marsh shoreline. So what do we do? We need to harden our shoreline sometimes. We need to engineer some kind of way to stop the erosion. If you want to live on the water, you're not necessarily going to just want to you know, throw up your hands and let your shoreline erode away. Well, I think that there's a solution that's somewhere in between the bulkhead and our, our natural system. And so the term living shoreline has been coined not just, not by me, um, but by federal agencies and conservation and restoration groups. And I put up this definition because living shoreline is a term that, that you, is, is very broadly defined and defined in different uh, ways by different people. I personally like this definition um, because it has a few key elements. So you have to have a natural component. You have to have something living for it to be called a living shoreline. Um, so it could be marsh, it can be oyster. Um, if you're in a more tropical setting, it can be coral or mangrove. Um, and then the other key part is you have to maintain this continuum between the upland area and uh, the inner tidal and the subtidal. So you can't have a wall in between your upland and your, your inner tidal area. And the reason that NOAA makes that distinction is that that wall is thought to create um, an environment where over time all of your intertidal habitat is eroded away because that wave, all the wave energy is coming in and hitting that wall and scouring out anything that's below it. And it happens over really long time scales. And so it's hard to measure, but that's, that's the fear, at least, with, with the vertical walls. So I decided I wanted to look at one particular kind of living shoreline that's really common here in North Carolina. Um, and I think it's simply based on what we traditionally had in many parts of the state and have actually lost over time. So um, not everywhere, but in particularly in salty areas, you typically have like a Spartina alterniflora or Juncus salt marsh. You have an intertidal um, oyster reef, and then you have um, a subtidal seagrass area. That's kind of the continuum. Now, parts of the state, you don't get intertidal oyster reefs. You only get subtidal. Um, but for the areas that I was studying, intertidal uh, reefs are the most common. But unfortunately, um, most of our intertidal reefs have been lost to a variety of factors. Some of it's over harvest, but a lot of it has to do with sedimentation and just movement of um, you know, channels and dredging that have caused uh, higher energy environments. And so the oysters have really just suffered from a whole suite of factors. And so a lot of our marshes actually look like this. It's a marsh, that, that edge of that marsh is eroding. Um, you may still have seagrass offshore, um, but you've got this kind of area in between that's slowly eroding uh, away. And so the solution that's been proposed and has actually been constructed in many parts of the state um, by private property owners, but also the North Carolina Coastal Federation and the Nature Conservancy is, is this offshore breakwater. And it's typically made of granite or marl or sometimes concrete. And the idea is that it provides that, that same kind of wave attenuation that that intertidal oyster reef would have provided. And it also provides some complex habitat for our little fish and crustaceans to kind of crawl in the crevices. Um, much like an oyster reef would. And so I compared uh, this, this type of living shoreline to the natural marsh I showed you before that lacked oyster reef. And then I compared it to, to areas that just had a bulkhead um, and maybe some offshore seagrass, but no oyster reef or anything else. 
Um, and so I did this over a number of years, um, primarily in the central part of North Carolina in, um, in Bogue Sound. Um, but I also had some sites, um, one in Hatteras, and I had some in the southern part of the state. Um, and these were actually, these were mostly um, waterfront property owner sites. So a property owner was kind enough to let me come onto their property every month at night and sample their fish. Three o'clock in the morning, I was there with a headlamp, walking into their backyard, and you know, like no one told me no. I was, I was really shocked. Like, I would knock on their door and say like, hey, so can I come and sample in the middle of the night for like the next six months or maybe three years and, you know, just like sneak onto your property? And everybody's like, sure, yeah, like tell me what you caught. And so, yeah, I, it was, I was amazed with the generosity and the openness and willingness of people to participate in my study. Um, the police, however, did not like it. <laughs> I was stopped many a time because we were driving a white van in like black wetsuits and headlamps. So yeah, that was not as fun. I finally had to just start paying a visit to the police um, every time I would go sample and say, hey guys, it's me. I'm not robbing people. Um, so it made for entertaining a uh, couple years of graduate school. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, I sampled these different types of shorelines. I had bulkheads. I had natural marshes, and then I had these, these living shorelines. And so rather than show you a graph, I'm going to show you in pictures what, what I caught. Um, so for bulkheads, you're catching a lot of little tiny fish along these shorelines for the most part. I use these big flume nets. I set them at high tide, fetch them at low tide, and it's all at night, primarily because these fish are going to be more active and also less likely to avoid your net at night. Um, they tend to avoid you know, a giant net if they can, but they can't see it at night. Um, and so at bulkhead sites, we had pretty low abundance of fish and low diversity. And we really only had what I call the usual suspects. We had pinfish, pigfish, and then occasionally maybe a snapper or, or two, but it might have been one individual. Um, and if anybody knows anything about pinfish, pinfish are everywhere. They're like the rats of the sea or like pigeons. I mean, they don't have a real like habitat niche. They will, they will occupy any available space. Um, so generalist species. In the marsh, I saw the same usual suspects, but I also saw a group of uh, fishes that were absent, they were notably absent from the bulkheads. And these are marsh resident fishes. So killifishes, uh, mummy chogs, a lot of small shrimps and small crustaceans um, that really need that structured vegetated habitat to hide in. Because if they're out in front of that bulkhead, they're getting eaten by anything that's cruising by. And then the surprising part to me was when I got to the marsh and the sill, the diversity and the abundance kind of took off. A lot of the organisms that are typically associated with oyster reefs suddenly showed up. So sheep's head, I had speckled trout, I even had some red drum, uh, mahara, just a lot of different little fishes and crustaceans. Um, not just a higher diversity, but a lot more of all of the individuals. They were occupying this marsh and, and kind of sill combination. So I do think there's some evidence that when you lack oyster reef and you have an erosion problem, putting up one of these offshore uh, breakwaters, even if it's rock, does seem to provide the, the right amount of habitat for, for some of these uh, organisms that we really care about. OK, so that's, that's my ecology side of the talk. Um, I realized very quickly that the ecology is important to me. It's important to some people. but regardless of how great um, this type of structure is for the environment, if it doesn't provide protection, if it doesn't stop erosion, no one's going to want to use a living shoreline. Um, and we didn't really know how they performed um, in terms of long-term performance. So a lot of these structures have only been in, at the time I started, you know, the oldest was maybe 10 years old. Um, and so we, we were really concerned about pitching this to waterfront property owners or, or me even being a part of the, the advocacy for living shorelines unless we knew how they performed, say, during a storm event. And so I couldn't have planned for this in graduate school. Um, and I was actually out of gradu graduate school um, by the time Hurricane Matthew hit. But fortunately, I convinced a, a starting PhD student um, in my former lab to continue with the work I was doing. And so we've been collaborating still. She's, she's about to finish in the next year. And so I'm going to talk about studies that we've done on the performance of living shorelines relative to other structure types, and also the performance of just a natural shoreline 
during three hurricanes that have hit North Carolina in the last uh, several years. So Hurricane Irene, Hurricane Arthur, and Hurricane Matthew. And I want to note here that these were not huge storms. You know, they weren't Category 5 hurricanes, but they did have some pretty serious impacts on our state and on, on our coastlines. Um, and so I think they're still really representative of probably what we're going to get typically, um, you know, most years along our coast. So when I started to think about how to look at the performance of these structures, um, I'm an ecologist. I'm not an engineer. But Hurricane Irene came through, passed right, the eye passed right over some of my study sites and then went up the coast. And I was like, well, I have to do something because this is like the, the opportunity you don't normally get when you're a grad student. Um, and so I searched the engineering literature and found this classification system that, that made sense to me. It was simply a visual classification system where you said, OK, here's my shoreline. What kind is it? Take a photo. And then you like standardize what you consider to be the type of damage um, that you can observe with that shoreline. Um, and I couple this with some other measurements I took, but I'm going to show you the visual classification first. Um, and so I first went to, to areas where um, we had expected and heard had some pretty you know, significant impacts from, from these different hurricanes. So this map is just showing some of the sites we surveyed in the second study we did, which included Hurricane Arthur. Um, but both Irene and Arthur are represented on this map. Um, the study site that's not shown on this map is actually Pinal Shores um, in Bogue Sound. Um, and so I'll show some data from that site as well. So what I mean in terms of a visual classification is exactly what it means. You ride along on a boat, you have a GPS and a camera, and you say, OK, what is the shoreline? And then what kind of damage? And so this category was what we called landward erosion. The structure is intact, but there's noticeable erosion landward in the property that that homeowner probably wanted to protect. And so in this area, like all of the, the upper shoreline is completely eroded away and the pipes are actually exposed. This is what we call structural damage. So the, the structure is still intact, um, but it's got some obvious warping. Maybe there's pieces mix, uh, missing. For bulkheads, you often have like kind of a cap at the top. Sometimes that was ripped off. Um, but it's still doing its job. It's still functioning to retain that sediment. If it was a riprap structure, it's rocks being displaced, um, you know, kind of moved around, um, noticeable um, you know, scouring in some areas. And I'll note this was only done for hardened structures. You can't do this for a natural shoreline because it's really hard to say like, what the state was before the storm with a, a natural marsh. This is what we call a breach. So you've actually got sediment. Um, that's coming out of the structure. If it was a riprap structure, it would be a noticeable gap um, where the rocks used to be and there's sediment coming out. So this structure is no longer performing the function it was supposed to. And then the last category is a complete collapse. So the whole structure's ended up in the water and everything behind it's gone into the water. And we saw this surprisingly more than I expected during Hurricane Irene and Arthur. So I will say for Irene and also for Arthur, Overwhelmingly, the, the damage was tied to bulkheads, to walls. Um, riprap, because I think it's, it's typically in this state made of, of heavy stone and pretty large stone, we did not see damage to riprap structures or breakwaters. Other parts of um, the country use lighter materials. And so I have heard that, that you can have displacement of some of the marl um, and some of that lighter material. But here, at least, um, we did not see that. But we had a pretty high percentage, I would say, of, of damage, um, particularly in certain areas. So overall, we only saw about 18% for Irene of the bulkheads damaged, um, a little over 20% for Arthur. And then one thing I want to point out here is that we also see a significant amount of the shoreline not being repaired. And so the reason that's important to note um, is that two years after Arthur, we still had about half of what was damaged not yet repaired, and that shoreline that's now vulnerable to future storms. So when you've already got some failure, you're likely to have even more failure moving on. So people, people are, are kind of left vulnerable to the next big storm. Um, so that was the story with the bulkheads. Um, we did see damage, um, and I should mention even in some sites, so for those of you familiar with the Rodanthe, Rodanthe Waves and Salvo area, 
75% of the bulkheads in that shoreline were damaged. So that was a real hot spot of just significant damage to people's shorelines. Um, so I do want to note that. Um, so in addition to looking at the, the hardened structures, I did want to have some way to talk about the natural shorelines. Um, and so fortunately, I had taken some, some pretty basic measurements of some natural shorelines and some living shorelines, the ones with the sills, before the storm. And then I was able to take them after the storm and then one year later to look at how they performed. And so these were sites that I surveyed in Pine Knoll Shores, uh, North Carolina, which was basically, for Irene, the eye went right over that area. Um, so it was hit pretty hard, maybe not as bad as the, the Outer Banks here. Um, and so the top graph is showing you the elevation of the land, okay, so the marsh elevation. And that's a proxy for um, erosion. If you have an elevation gain, that means you had more sediment come in. If you had an elevation loss, it means you actually lost some of your, your sediment in your marsh. And so what we saw is essentially we had uh, no change. So this is 2010 is before Hurricane Irene. 2011 is immediately after Hurricane Irene. 2012 is, is one year later. And so even though there's actually a difference in terms of um, the actual elevation between uh, blue is living shorelines, so those breakwaters and natural marshes, living shorelines tended to be higher in elevation, and that's partially because they tend to accrete sediment um, a little bit faster. There's no change through time, so no, no effect of the storm, essentially. With, uh, then we also measured vegetation. So this is how many uh, marsh plants are present. And so before the storm, we had a certain number of marsh plants. Immediately after the storm, we did see a drop in the plants. So there were some plants lost to the hurricane. But the interesting thing is, in particular with the living shorelines, so when you have that rock structure, we see a rebound a year later. So those plants come back naturally. And that's a big distinction between a bulkhead and, say, a living shoreline. With a bulkhead, you have to go out and you have to spend money and you have to repair it. With the living shoreline, the living component can bounce back. Um, without much intervention. And I talked to a lot, all of the property owners at these sites, and they all said, yep, I didn't, I didn't have to do anything. The plants came back next year. So, so that was a good, um, good finding. And just because I think that photos are really helpful um, in understanding uh, what's going on in these systems, these are two properties in, in Pine Hill Shores that are essentially one lot apart. They have an empty lot between them. It's about 50 meters between the two properties. And so this is a bulkheaded shoreline, and this is a living shoreline, and this is a year before the storm. The marsh actually had just been planted by myself and some other volunteers for the property owner. Um, so that's why the marsh looks pretty sparse. And then this is after the storm. Um, so the property owner's bulkhead collapsed. He told me he had to refill with about 22 truckloads, dump truckloads of sediment, and then rebuild the bulkhead, and it cost him upwards of $10,000 to rebuild. Um, the Living Shoreline property owner, um, aside from having to pay someone to actually come and remove debris from his yard, did not have to do anything. The plants, um, he saw a little bit of scour, but like I said, he was one of the property owners who said the plants came back the next year. Um, the water is still high, because this was right after the hurricane, but the rocks were all in place, and he was pretty happy with his choice. So we wanted to expand upon this work. Um, we had done this you know, kind of as a reaction to, to Irene and Arthur. Um, and so Hurricane Matthew came along. And this is really where um, this other graduate student, Carter Smith, really took the lead and started studying um, a larger suite of sites across the whole state. So she basically worked from South Park, Southport to Ocracoke and had different types of shorelines in each of these regions. So she had bulkheads, she had living shorelines, and she had marsh. And she took all of the same measurements that I, I mentioned earlier, elevation and, density, and vegetation density measurements. And she took them before the storm, um, after the storm, and then one year later. So she kind of set up hoping she would get a hurricane. I know that's like really bad to say in the state. <laughs> but like, we were all kind of like, come on, hurricane. But not too bad, just like a little hurricane. Um, and so. Yeah, you, you really you feel guilty, but you're like, oh, science. Um, and so this is uh, data that she collected. And so these graphs are showing um, waterward elevation. So this is the elevation of the ground right uh, waterward of whatever the structure is. So if it's a wall, it's like the elevation right below that wall. Um, if it's a, a breakwater, it's right below that breakwater. And if it's a marsh, it's right below that marsh edge. 
Um, and then landward is, you know, right landward of that structure. So that's the property that people want to protect. And so if you are on the, if you are below uh, zero, it means you lost elevation. If you are above zero, it means you gained elevation. Green is a natural marsh with no stabilization structure associated with it. Uh, blue is a living shoreline, and black is a bulkhead. And so what we saw is immediately post Hurricane Matthew, so pre from pre to post, the change we saw was that natural marshes with no uh, structure in front of them, they actually lost elevation. So just a natural shoreline, we saw a dip in the elevation. Living shorelines, we actually saw an increase. So sediment was actually being dumped behind that breakwater um, by that big storm surge. And then for bulkheads, they were neutral. Um, oh, sorry, that was for uh, landward. For waterward elevation, sediment was actually getting piled up right up against the breakwater. So when, when that structure was attenuating that wave energy, the sediment particles are kind of dropping out right in front of the structure. Um, for the landward elevation, we actually saw a loss for all three structures, although the living shoreline was just a slight loss. Um, and we'll have, I'll show you some pictures to kind of represent um, what that looked like um, in the next slide. Now, the next year, so this is one year post Matthew, um, we saw a slightly different story. So again, this is waterward and landward. We, we see a rebound um, waterward. So the natural marsh that lost some elevation waterward of its edge really ended up kind of neutral. So no difference. Living shoreline stayed above, so they, it was a net gain in elevation um, even a year later. So that sediment that came in with the storm stayed. And then a bulkhead um, actually ended up with a gain in elevation too, and I'll show you why uh, in the next slide. Um, and then for landward elevation, so again, this is the property that's being protected, we did actually see that the marsh overall stayed at a, at a loss. Um, so we were losing marsh shoreline um, even one year later. There wasn't this recovery of the elevation. Um, and then the living shoreline, we saw a gain. And a bulkhead, we again saw a gain in elevation one year later. So the reason we see these changes in terms of what we observed is that for natural marshes, we, we actually had loss of the marsh. Okay, So these PVC markers were put in at the beginning of the study. And they were put in right at the marsh edge. Well, at the end of the study, the marsh is no longer at those markers. It's actually eroded back. Um, so without any kind of protection along the edge, we are seeing, um, for these particular sites, loss of the marsh. For bulkheads, we saw a loss of elevation landward of that wall. And it was often by you know, kind of scouring out. The waves were overtopping the bulkheads, coming in and scouring out that area. And then the reason we see a gain after, one year later is people came back in and they filled it themselves. So this is not a natural recovery. And so we talked to the you know, property owners, and it was like, yeah, well, they came in and they replanted their nice lawn. And you know, that, that's your way of uh, recovering if you're a bulkhead owner. Um, and the living shorelines, like we saw, you know, at, at best, they gained sediment. And so things were really looking pretty good for the living shorelines. So now I'm going to switch to the last part of my talk. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm one person. We usually have a small research team. And I really felt like we were only taking snapshots of you know, just a few properties through time. And so I really wanted to, to engage people who are actually living on the water beyond just the handful of property owners that were willing and crazy enough to let me come on their property all the time. And so we decided to send out a survey. And it's possible that either you or your neighbor got this at some point in 2014, because I sent out 6,000 postcards to waterfront property owners. And I sent them out twice. Um, and people were actually nice enough to take what I now view as an incredibly long, probably tedious survey online. Um, it was 75 questions. And I got 850 people to actually take my survey. So I really appreciate that. If you were one of my survey respondents, thank you. Um, and so we had some incentives, like you could get a, an Amazon gift card. But I mean, really, like, <laughs> it was a long survey to take. Um, and we surveyed people all over the state. So this shows that the respondents that we had. And so that's the distribution. So we really did feel like we, we covered um, the coastal counties pretty, pretty well. There's a few places where we didn't get great coverage. Um, but, but we did feel like we were getting a much better representation of what's going on with our shorelines than just us going out there to a handful of sites. 
And so this survey, it was 75 questions. We asked them all kinds of stuff. And I'm only going to show you just a few of the responses, because that would take hours to go through um, all of the great information we received from property owners. And this, first, this slide is going to show you um, two important things uh, relative to different shoreline structures. So we asked property owners to tell us how many times they had incurred a cost associated with a hurricane to their shore protection structure. We asked them what type of structure they had along their shoreline, and then how many times they had actually incurred damage that they had to spend money on to repair, and then how, um, how much money they spent in terms of maintenance. Um, so if they spent any maintenance, first just whether or not they spent any money at all on maintenance, um, these are the top two graphs. So this is the proportion of respondents that had any hurricane damage ever, ever incurred that they, you know, where they actually spent money. The black bar is bulkheads, the white bar is natural marsh shorelines, and then the gray is riprap. You'll notice we don't have living shorelines in here because we actually only had five people who had living shorelines respond and give us data, so we really didn't feel like that was a good comparison. We wish we could, but we just, we just didn't have it. Um, and so what you, what you want to note from here is that really the bulkhead owners reported more um, damage costs or more times of damage. And actually, when they spent money, they spent more money than your natural shoreline property owners. Riprap was about the same in terms of number of times they had damage um, that they spent money on. Um, but they actually spent less money when they did spend money. Um, in terms of maintenance, it's the same thing. Bulkhead owners are spending more um, are more often spending money on maintenance, and they're actually spending more when they are spending money on maintenance than your natural or riprap shorelines. Now, from a bulkhead natural comparison, this makes sense, right? You have a natural shoreline. Unless you're spending money on planting more marsh, which is pretty cheap, you shouldn't be spending that much money. Maybe you have to occasionally bring in sand. Um, but overall, that's going to be cheaper than having to maintain a wall. Um, and riprap, I think, again, like people were having this big stone material in, just like our survey shows, those stones aren't really going anywhere. Um, we did actually ask also about labor, so number of days they spent maintaining. And that's where riprap actually goes up. Um, so I do think there's this um, individual property owners are actually maintaining the riprap shorelines themselves rather than spending money paying someone else to do it. They're moving the rock structures around um, and whatnot. So that's just to highlight, you know, bulkheads, people are spending more money. So if you're spending more money, um, you know, I really wanted to understand maybe why. So why? Why would people have bulkheads? Um, you know, are you, um, we asked them a whole series of questions about what they perceived in terms of um, durability and cost effectiveness. And people overwhelmingly said bulkheads were the most durable, the most cost effective. Um, and, and they were, you know, just they felt the most comfortable with them. Um, but then our data that they're reporting to us are kind of showing, well, they're not necessarily the most cost effective, but maybe, and maybe not the most durable given the, the hurricane um, data we collected. And so we said, okay, well, maybe people are influenced by what their neighbor does, you know, because you tend to see these pockets of the same types of structures um, put in. And so we asked people, you know, how much does what your neighbor does what your neighbor does influence what you do. And for bulkhead owners, it was actually quite a lot. So the, the red is a great deal, um, pink is a fair amount, and you know, the lighter pink is only a little. But still, we had you know, almost 70% of bulkhead owners say that what their neighbor did um, influenced what they did. Um, Riprap was very close, but then when you get down to living shoreline and natural, it kind of makes sense. Um, even though we had a few, only a few responses for living shorelines, um, we wanted to put them up there. They're just not influenced as much, primarily because if you have a natural shoreline, you're probably not doing a whole lot. And so you're like, well, no, my neighbor doesn't influence me. And property owners said that they really believe that their structure type is beneficial for their property and also for their neighbor's property. So likely, people are talking to their neighbors about, about the, the type of protection they use. So if you have an erosion problem, you might ask your neighbor, well, hey, what did you do, or do you like your bulkhead? So there's definitely um, a connection between um, people and these individual decisions they're making. Well, we didn't want to just stop there, so we decided to throw a whole bunch of data <laughs> into a model and say, OK, people are telling us this. 
but maybe it's because they're all like, um, you know, clustered in these areas of high wave energy, and so it's really the environment that's driving these decisions. And, you know, a bulkhead has to be here because nothing else would work. And so we threw factors in, like what county you lived in, what region of the state, what the fetch was associated with your property, uh, the tidal range, the type of water body, um, your neighbor's shore condition, of course, because people had said this was important, um, and then demographic factors, like how long you'd lived there, your age, education, income, occupational uh, dependence on coastal resources. So that might indicate, you know, how how connected you are to coastal ecosystems, and then perceptions in terms of climate change and perceived value of coastal habitats. And all of that came out to really guess what? What your neighbor does is the most important factor. Okay, <laughs> so people know what they're talking about. I didn't have to do this whole modeling exercise. I just had to ask people, and so that was really cool to me. That if you had, um, if your neighbor had a bulkhead or riprap, you were going to have a hardened shoreline. And if your neighbor had a living shoreline or a natural marsh, you were going to have a natural marsh or a living shoreline. Simple as that. When I asked people um, it, what their preference would be if they could do it all over again, it was the same, um, except with, with one exception. So if you had a bulkhead, they would pick a bulkhead again. They were happy with what they chose, and they were happy with what their neighbor had. So same situation, even if they could go back in time and do it all over again. And then. The, the one change we had here is that riprap homeowners actually switched sides. And so they said if they could do it all over again, if their neighbor had a riprap or living shoreline or natural shoreline, they would actually try a living shoreline. So that was kind of the shift we saw is that um, bulkhead owners were bulkhead, but other, other variations were more flexible to the living shoreline. So what does this mean in terms of management? Um, if anybody is a waterfront property owner, you know there's some hoops you have to go through to, to get a shoreline stabilization structure. It's not the same for a bulkhead as it is for a living shoreline. Right now it's easier to get a bulkhead than a living shoreline. Permitting process is longer and more painful. Um, and so there's a continuum here of solutions. I'm by no means saying that we shouldn't have bulkheads. There are places where bulkhead is really the only thing that's gonna work. You know, you have canal systems, you have super high energy areas, marinas, um, you know, the slope is not right. Um, sometimes a bulkhead is the way to go. But I do think we need to have um, policies in place and permitting regulations in place and also uh, contractors and engineers who are knowledgeable enough to do these kinds of structures out there and available for property owners because there's certainly an interest in it um, from the ecology standpoint. We, we definitely want to see more living shorelines. Um, but we also understand that the, the knowledge and the know-how has to be out there um, for people to feel comfortable going in that direction. And that's where I'm really focused on right now is working with the permitting agencies and also working with engineering firms to try to make this a more available, um, you know, viable option for people. So when you could have a landscape art, what would you call that type of landscape? You know, there are, pe there are landscape architects who are now specializing in living shorelines. They're advertising their services. So I'm seeing it more and more, and it, it's really exciting. Um, yeah, it doesn't have to be an engineer. I mean, you, you, can be, you don't have to be an engineer to put in a bulkhead. Marine contractors are not necessarily engineers. If it's a pretty standard design, you don't have to do um, engineering plans or anything like that. So the last, kind of the next steps in my mind in terms of, of Shoreline hardening and understanding it is, I've showed you storm um, effects. Those were only three storms. You know, it's smaller storms. Who knows what a Category 5 would do? I have a feeling that no structure <laughs> is going to survive. Um, you know, so you should just really accept that maybe. Um, but we are really interested in this long-term performance. What kind of issues might arise? Um, we understand a snapshot in time of the ecology, but we don't know if, you know, in 30 years, are these living shorelines going to be better than bulkheads? Are we going to end up with this weird habitat that's not very functional? We don't know. And so I have a new grant um, with a geologist and some graduate students, and we're going to actually revisit shorelines that are now old enough that we can do some long-term, um, you know, comparison. We're going to involve citizen scientists. So I was so impressed with the property owners that I surveyed that we really want to recruit um, waterfront property owners to help us take data. Yeah, so if you're interested after this talk, please come and talk to me. We are starting this summer. Um, 
And we're not going to ask you to go tromping through the marsh. We're going to try to do some photo-based monitoring um, and observational monitoring. Um, so lots of new technology out there that we're going to try, um, drones, remote sensing. Um, and so we have lots more to do. It's not, not a done story. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop, thank all my co-authors, all my funding sources, all of the technicians that spent way too much time out at night, and I'll take questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.